All right, good afternoon, procurement fans. Welcome to the Contracts Committee of New York City Council. Today is Wednesday, October 10th, 2018. My name is Justin Brennan, and I have the privilege of chairing uh, this committee. Before we begin, I want to extend my thanks to Council Member Cornegie, who is, won't be joining us, as a but he's the chair of the uh, Council's MWBE Business Task Force, uh, as well as the MWBE community for joining us in this hearing today. Uh, the City Council has long supported the MWBE community in New York City and has as assisted with MWBEs making great strides towards expanding their role in both city procurement and the private sector. The City's MWBE program was established in 2005 in order to address the historical disparities in city procurement between the number of minority and women-owned businesses available to contract with the city and the number that are actually awarded city contracts. While we commend the hard work being done by SBS and the Mayor's Office of MWBEs via their training, networking, and business development programs, I think we can all agree that more still remains to be done. In FY18, the city's contract budget was $19.8 billion. Of this, $5.3 billion was for contracts subject to the MWBE program. And of that number, only 16%, roughly $835 million, was actually awarded to MWBE prime contractors. When MWBE subcontractors are included in that analysis, the number jumps to around 19% of eligible contracts. However, this is still woefully short of the mayor's stated goal of achieving 30% MWBE utilization. So how can we improve these numbers? The low-hanging fruit here is understanding each department's utilization rate in order to identify which agencies of the city are most effective in supporting MWBEs and which are struggling. When considered on an agency-by-agency -agency basis, the disparity between agency utilization is stark. 72% of all MWBE contracts citywide were awarded by the Department of Design and Construction, the Parks Department, and DEP. The, Depart the DD DDC, in particular, has increased its contracting with MWBEs by nearly $92 million over FY17. It's roughly 25% of an increase in just one year. While this is certainly an impressive improvement, DDC alone has a $2.3 billion budget for MWBE eligible contracts. So it comes as no surprise that they are awarding the, lar the largest dollar value of contracts to MWBEs. But when considered as a percentage, DDC falls toward the middle to low end of agencies supporting MWBEs, awarding less than 20% of their MWBE eligible contracts to MWBE firms. On the other end of the spectrum, the Commission on Human Rights awarded nearly 78% of its eligible contracts to NWBEs, and the Department of Small Business Services, who is joining us here today, awarded almost 75% of its eligible contracts to NWBEs. Admittedly, both these agencies have much smaller budgets, but they are obviously making an effort, which is more than I can say, unfortunately, for some of the other agencies whose numbers make it look like they're hardly trying. DOT awarded a paltry 2% of its $645 million budget in MWBE, uh, MWBE eligible contracts. Similarly, the uh, Do It, City Planning, FDNY, each awarded less than 5% of their MWBE eligible contracts in FY18 to MWBEs. Instead of highlighting the agencies with the great successes in MWBE contracting, uh, we feel the administration should hold these underperforming agencies accountable and do whatever it takes to triage and to improve their utilization rates. Uh, we on the committee do not expect full utilization from every agency, certainly, but when numbers are that low, it speaks volumes to the lack of effort to fulfill the goals of the overall MWBE program. We hope this hearing will provide this committee with an opportunity to discuss some of the roadblocks these underperforming agencies are having in their procurement processes and what steps the administration can take to improve the numbers of the agencies at the low end of the list and how the council can, can be helpful. Like the mayor, 
uh, the city council is committed to reaching 30% utilization overall. I think we should all work to improve the MWBE utilization rates of the worst performing agencies so we can get there together. I want to thank Council Member Perkins for joining me today and my other colleagues that will eventually show up. I uh, have to also thank the Contracts Committee staff, my Legislative Council, Alex Polinoff, Policy Analyst Cassie Addison, Finance Analyst Andrew Wilbur, Finance Unit Head John Russell, and my Senior Advisor John Yedin for their hard work in putting this hearing together. And with that, I'll give it to Alex to uh, swear everybody in. Would you please raise your right hands? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Great, you may begin. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Brennan and members of the Council's Committee on Contracts. Uh, my name is John Doris, and I'm the Senior Advisor and Director of the Mayor's Office of MWBEs. Uh, today I will provide an overview of the City's MWBE program, including the progress made toward our MWBE certification and utilization goals uh, set by this administration. With me today are Greg Bishop, the Commissioner of the Department of Small Business Services, and Dan Simon, the Director of the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, to answer questions that may be specific to their work. Uh, in the fall of 2016, Mayor Bill de Blasio announced the creation of the Mayor's Office of MWBEs as a critical next step in the administration's commitment to increase contract and opportunities uh, for minority and women entrepreneurs. The mayor pledged ambitious goals of achieving 30% MWBE utilization by the end of fiscal year 2021 and having 9,000 city certified MWBEs by the end of fiscal year 2019. In 2015, the mayor outlined a separate citywide goal to award 16 billion to uh, MWBEs over the next 10 years. This one NYC goal, the 30% goal, covers both mayoral and non-mayoral agencies. On the heels of the mayor, I'm sorry, of May 2018 disparity study, the mayor announced that we were $1.8 billion ahead of our one NYC goal and decided to increase our goal from 16 billion to 20 billion by 2025. We are excited to have the new leadership of Deputy Mayor Phil Thompson whose career-long justice and equity work includes increasing economic development opportunities by calling out and challenging structural and historical barriers in the marketplace and within government. Under the supervision of the Deputy Mayor, SBS, MOX, uh, play an integral role in implementing the MWBE program. SBS certifies MWBEs and provides essential capacity building services and technical assistance to ensure they can compete for and execute on city contracts. MOX tracks and reports on utilization data for all city contracts under Local Law 1. The purpose of the city's MWBE program is to remedy the impact of discrimination in the market where the city uh, makes its procurements. This impact is statistically uh, analyzed in a disparity study. The most recent disparity study demonstrated that MWBE firms are underutilizing city procurements. Local Law 1 of 2013 established citywide contracting goals which match the disparity gaps revealed by the 2011 disparity data analysis. The city will make policy changes in accordance to the key findings and recommendations of the disparity study that has uh, been published this past May. Along with my colleagues here today, my office will continue to play a strategic role in ensuring that city agencies remain focused on achieving the goals of the program. Since the start of the administration, the number of certified firms have increased by 86%. As of the close of fiscal year 18, the number of certified firms was 6,829. Additionally, at the end of fiscal year 18, Mox reported this MWBE utilization at 19%, representing 1.069 or 1.07 billion in contracts to MWBEs um, under Local Law 1, as compared to 8% or four, si $465 dollars million value of city contracts in fiscal year 15 at the start of the administration. 
We are also very happy to report that since 2015, over 10 billion, 10 billion has been awarded to MWBEs by mayoral and non-mayoral agencies um, citywide, pursuant to our one NYC goal. Since the enactment of Local Law 1, the city has implemented a number of creative initiatives to help MWBEs build capacity and obtain capital and has, and has also advanced for state legislative initiatives to give the city more tools for its MWBE program. Pursuant to Local Law 1 and the goals therein, the percentage of dollars awarded to MWBE subject to the city's program has trended upward from 8% in fiscal year uh, 15 to nearly 20% in fiscal year 18. Just to put that into perspective, at the close of fiscal year 18, we are proud to report that in record time, the city is closing in on our 30% goal, which we know we can achieve. Still, we have more to do. We are lowering and, where possible, removing structural barriers to ensuring the city's procurement marketplace uh, provides resources for increasing MWBEs in programming at city agencies and creating strategic initiatives to increase MWB's ability to compete success successfully. In accordance with the four core principles of our program, accountability, accessibility, capacity, and sustainability, we have implemented initiatives to address these issues uh, that MWBEs face in the private marketplace, namely access to capital, which is a common obstacle for many small and mid-sized firms. In order to respond to this need, the administration launched the Contract Finance Loan Fund and the Bond Collateral Assistance Fund, both administered by SBS and the Emerging Developer uh, Fund, which is administered by EDC. Together, the initial investment from the administration across these funds totals 30 billion, 30 million, sorry. As you may know, the mayor also convened the city's banks um, to begin a discussion about a partnership to create accessible capital for more MWBEs in New York City. During last September's hearing, we noted that the discussions with the banks were ongoing. Early this year, on February 21st, we announced that three of those banks made the commitment to invest to MWBEs to the tune of additional $40 million. In the spring of 2017, we were joined by many MWBEs, advocates, and stakeholders, including the city agencies, in calling for the passage of uh, S6513 A8505, uh, the bill proposed increasing the city's discretionary spending limit for goods and services purchased for MWBEs and giving the city the authority uh, already provided to the state to offer MWBEs price preferences uh, on procurements. The bill passed overwhelmingly in the Assembly and the, and the State Senate, and for that, we thank our elected partners, including our council members here today, for their advocacy and support. This change provides MWBEs with access to more and larger contracts to help build capacity and succeed as prime contractors. The discretionary threshold for goods and purchases was implemented on March 5, 2018, and by June 30th, at the end of the fiscal year, we had 181 contracts were awarded to MWBEs in the amount of approximately 12.5 million. We plan to return to Albany this session and advocate for state approval for innovative policy tools that the city has previously requested but have not yet received. We understand what a valuable tool a mentor-protege program can be, specifically in the construction industry setting. Many state agencies and public authorities, such as the MTA, have implemented this type of mentorship program pursuant to the authority granted by state legislation. We hope to be able to do the same, but need state authorization. Additionally, we will seek the authority to create pre-qualified lists exclusively for MWBEs for city, uh, city agencies. This would enable the city to reserve certain procurement opportunities to MWBEs. The Housing Preservation uh, Department, HPD, has been able to do something similar by creating pre-qualified lists of MWBE developers to certain projects pursuant to state legislation enacted in 2014. HPD's MWBE pre-qual program established pursuant to the authority aims to increase contracting opportunities for certified MWBEs in HPD, HDC subsidized affordable housing projects. In January 2017, 
the mayor, HBD, and OMWBE announced that eight MWBEs have been selected to lead construction of six new 100% affordable housing developments, 440 homes for seniors and New Yorkers with a variety of income levels, including extremely low income and formerly homeless households. Although these projects were development projects rather than procurement contracts, and so did not count towards city's utilization goals under Local Law 1, they are a valuable demonstration of how pre-qualified lists allowed HPD to meet the double, down, double bottom line here by employing many of the city's MWBEs to build its affordable housing. We want MWBEs to have the opportunity to join MWB exclusive pre-qualified list in the procurement setting as well. Going forward, we will continue to work closely with the council and our elected partners on MWBE outreach, networking, and educational events. We will also continue to meet regularly with interested council members to share updates on the program's milestones. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and your continued support and advocacy for our program. We would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Right on, thank you very much. Um, let me know when you guys head to Albany because I'd be happy to come with you. Um, the, Absolutely. The last, the last bit of your, your testimony there was very, very hopeful. So hopefully we can partner up there however we can. Uh, I want to recognize Councilman uh, Calvin Yeager who's joined us. And um, I wanted to, to jump right into um, the announcement that, that came today on the success of the One New York City, One NYC program. Um, certainly appreciate that it's on track to exceed its goals by 2025. Um, but what I'm trying to figure out is what happens when we remove the non-mayoral agencies from that number? Is the performance of the mayoral agencies at the same level as agencies such as uh, NYCHA or EDC? So thank you, uh, Council Member, for, uh, for that question. Um, first of all, we are excited about the $10 billion that we announced today. Um, that's an historic number um, that we are very proud of, uh, that we're able to um, uh, contract with that many MWBEs for that in number. I mean, it's historic. I don't think anyone in the nation has done that, and we're very excited about that. How, are we there yet? No, but certainly that is a, a significant benchmark. Um, we know that uh, the split between mayoral and non-mayorals, I want to make sure I get to the actual number here, but the split between mayorals and non-mayorals, um, we see that the mayoral agencies actually are doing better. And in our report that we do publish, um, the 1NYC Bulletin, you would see um, that the mayoral agencies are uh, doing um, about $4.8 billion and uh, non-mayorals about 4.5 or so as of the end of the fiscal year. So, so they are doing, uh, mayoral, mayoral agencies are doing um, a little bit better than the non-mayoral agencies. So what is, what's the, the fundamental difference between the One NYC plan and the NWBE program? Uh, the One NYC uh, program um, uh, covers um, some of the, the restricted procurements that Local Law 1 has. Um, we will count those, for instance, if an MWBE is hired by an agency on a project that is not included in the local law one program, um, then we do count that as one NYC. So it's really a volume goal. How many MWBEs are actually participating in our program? The local law one program uh, does have uh, restrictions uh, as to what we can count, um, government, uh, intergovernmental contracts, uh, various types of emergency contracts, et cetera. Um, that the law uh, prohibits us from putting goals on. Uh, so we report on where we can put goals on, but our program is not just, um, we don't want it to be uh, confined to what where we can put goals on. Wherever uh, we can count MWBE utilization, we will. And so that number is a volume number that we count. Wherever MWBE is awarded, doesn't matter if it's included or excluded in the uh, local law one program, um, we will count them in the one NYC program. So the, the one NYC goal then, does that count contracts that are awarded to any business owned by a woman or minority or only those that are in or are classified as MWBE or in the program? 
uh, there they count, I believe, the certified MWBEs with the city. Okay. Um, do you have an idea of how many MWBE certified uh, firms are locally based? I do, Council Member. Uh, yeah, so I, I'll take that question. Uh, when you say locally based, uh, what do you, uh, can you be more specific? Because uh, we have, uh, our certification program is one of those unique programs at SBS where it's a geographic region. So, for example, uh, if you're talking about local, are you talking about the five boroughs? Or are you talking about uh, within the purchasing area of New York City? I just want to be clear on your it's question. Five boroughs. So, in the five boroughs, um, I'm just doing this math really quick. Uh, about maybe it looks like about 60 something percent of our, our firms are certified from the five boroughs. And how many of those approximately 60 percent were awarded contracts in FY18? Uh, let, let me get back to you on that. Okay. Um, are non-local businesses considered in the one NYC numbers as well? So, and sorry. So for one NYC, we count certified firms. Um, so, the, if if the firm is certified, then they are counted in one NYC. Okay, but they could be from Wisconsin. No. So, so so when we talk about the the catchment area, yeah. uh, they have to have some type of intent to do business with New York City. Okay. Um, so when we look at sort of, when we try, when we look at, um, you know, when the company is certifying, they have to show some type of intent that they are uh, looking to do business in New York City. Um, if their headquarters happens to be in Wisconsin, uh, they have a presence in New York City. Uh, and therefore they're looking to do business in New York City, and therefore they are, and as long as they're, uh, the control, it's controlled and operated by the eligible group member, uh, then they're uh, they're able to uh, certify. So what would constitute doing business, having an interest in doing business in the city? It could be a number of things. Uh, they could have employees here. Uh, they can have, um, uh, they can look to actually uh, register to do business with the city. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, apply for uh, uh, a FMS number. Uh, there's a number of ways that you show intent of doing business with New York City. Uh, so there's, there's a number of things that uh, uh, counts in that particular area. Um, I guess sort of the overarching thing is that it seems some agencies outperform others uh, in contracting uh, with MWBEs. How, how do you guys, how does the administration measure an agency's success rate? Um, we... Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think we, we do that in several ways. And, and one, I think that we have to uh, look at every agency. And uh, when we look at every agency, every agency you know, sort of procures certain types of services um, or goods. And you have to look at our um, available uh, MWBEs in that space, mm -hmm. their ability to perform the work and to do the scopes that are required of that work. And if they are available, just means that, not that they are just on the list, but are they available? Are they busy? Um, are they working? Are they interested? And that's sort of part of the procurement process. Um, and so I, we like to keep in, in context here in the sense that some agencies have um, very difficult um, and challenging areas of scopes of work. And uh, you know we are developing our MWBEs to help meet those needs. But other agencies have MWBEs who are readily available to do certain scopes of work that are a bit more um, uh, uh, available at the time, and so it's it's a it's a it's a um, it's a it's a fluctuating scale, if I may, uh, as to it pertains to who's available when, when procurements go out. Um, every agency put out a procurement plan. Uh, we use that plan to uh, get the MWBE community ready. Uh, for the upcoming opportunities. And also they put out a utilization plan where they think opportunities will actually uh, uh, match. Part of that process is what we call the performance improvement plan, which we submit to the council every year uh, of the work that the agencies will do. And on a, on a monthly basis and a quarterly basis, we do meet and assess 
who's meeting goals and where uh, the challenges are and help to work with those agencies to actually um, get them to where they need to be. So that's the general uh, construct and how we hold agencies accountable, but also check on their utilization throughout the year. So is success then based on the total dollar value awarded or the percentage of eligible contracts? Like someone like DDC, um, they've awarded a large dollar amount, $467 million to MWBEs, um, but that only represents 20% of their $2.3 billion budget. Is that a success? I, I think uh, if, if we look prior to this administration and at the beginning of this administration where we started at 8% utilization, we were at 11.4% last year uh, when we started our office, and now we're at 19%, almost 20%. That tells me we're going in the right direction, council member. Uh, however, I do uh, feel that you know we're not satisfied because we didn't reach our 30% goal. Now, the mayor set the goal for 2021, and we did that um, very thoughtfully because we understood that availability of the firms, also the workload that we anticipate as a city and the development that we have to do with our firms and the services that we have to provide and resources that we have to provide to the firms to actually help us to get to the 30%. So, so yes, I mean, there's significant improvement uh, as, we, as you mentioned with DDC in particular uh, and some other agencies, but also there's work to be done and we know that and that's why we, uh, estimated about 2021, where we know we will uh, get to that 30%, 30% goal. Um, one or two more things I want to hand it over to my colleagues and uh, recognize uh, Councilman Brad Lander, who's joined us. Um, I know I have personally heard and, and other members have heard um, from several representatives of various industries um, who all sort of are singing the same song as far as a difficulty engaging um, with MWBE contractors. Um, and when performance rates are as low as we've seen for some of the agencies, is there a plan or a strategy to leverage or better engage more with private industry to um, try to get those numbers up? I mean, we, you know, we hear it quite a bit. I mean, I ran into um, some folks last week in the rotunda who are dying to do business, you know, and are just having trouble um, just getting in the door, I guess. So um, what, what strategies are, especially with the agencies that are, that, are, that are very, in comparison, sort of underperforming, what is being done to leverage um, private industry, private sector? So I'll start and then uh, Commissioner Bishop could talk a little bit about their, their programs uh, that they're running. Uh, so from the mayor's office, MWB, we're a really one-stop shop for, for the program. And we have actively been engaging um, with uh, the private sector or what we call our prime, co prime contracting community because ultimately they, uh, they subcontract out to MWBEs and or join in joint ventures um, uh, for future opportunities. So we have been uh, in communication with, with those and the organizations and, and that actually represent those prime contractors uh, to talk about how we can possibly uh, work with those particular agencies. Now, there is some outreach that, that we do and which the um, uh, commissioner can talk a little bit about, specific outreach with specific agencies and also industries, but uh, we feel that uh, if, an, if someone, did, you may run into an MWBE who do not, uh, or, or feels like they're not uh, getting any kind of traction in our program. That's why our office was created. And certainly we've had uh, several hundred over the last two years interactions with actual MWBEs and helping steer them in the right direction. And so uh, we're happy to hear from you. Um, when you get those requests, you please send them to us and we will help them to navigate that process. And Commissioner Bishop can talk a little bit more of the outreach efforts. Yeah, so, yeah, and just to be clear, if the, the, those companies, were they MWBs or, or if they were prime contractors, either way. They're uh, MWBs. Okay, so yeah. for MWBs, certainly uh, I have, and, and, and the team at SBS has been very aggressive in reaching out to MWBs uh, for a number of reasons. One, we have um, a goal of, hit, of certifying 9,000 firms uh, by the end of this fiscal year. 
and we want to make sure that we certify the firms that are looking to do work with the city. Uh, so certainly we have worked with council members uh, to get the word out about our programs. Uh, at SBS, we have a number of um, uh, capacity building programs and assistance for, for example, uh, we have uh, put our application online. Uh, we've made it easier uh, to actually start the process of getting certified. Uh, we do a number of workshops where individuals who are not uh, are not uh, clear on what we are asking can come in and get one-on-one -on -one assistance. Uh, through a, a network of NYC Business Solution Centers, we have staff that's specifically responsible for helping MWBs put the package together. So, uh, so we're trying to eliminate the barrier there uh, in terms of getting uh, uh, companies certified. Uh, once they're certified, we have re-energized our, now, we, now it's, it's called I'm Certified, Now What? program. Uh, where once they're certified, we bring them back in uh, and we help them develop a business development strategy. Uh, so what that means is that if you are uh, selling widgets, we want to make sure that you are uh, connecting to the right agencies that need to buy widgets. Uh, so we have a team that's uh, solely responsible for analyzing the buying power of the city and figure out where we actually uh, should connect those MWBs. If you're a prime contractor and you're having problems finding firms with the capacity uh, to do the, the type of work that you need them to do, uh, we certainly need to know about that. Uh, one of the things that we can do is look at uh, our database and look for additional uh, uh, information that you may need uh, to, before you engage a, a, a MWB, or if we are lacking in that area, uh, we want to make sure we reach out to our uh, regional partners. For example, there are MWBs that are doing work with the Port Authority, uh, with uh, the MTA, uh, with the state of New York, and they're not certified with us. They're not doing work in New York City. So we want to know, and we've been working with our partners to understand who those companies are, identify those companies, reach out to those companies uh, aggressively, and find out why they're not doing business in New York City. Uh, we've worked with other uh, entities like uh, MSDC uh, and uh, WPO. These are uh, private sector certifying bodies uh, that the private sector uses um, uh, to find MWBs uh, to also encourage those firms, and we have a fast track relationship with those eight entities uh, to actually bring more companies in. So there's a number of things that we can do to make it not only easier for MWB to start participating, uh, but if that MWB even hasn't bid on city work, uh, we have a, a service available where we'll re review their bid submission before they submit it because that's one of the challenges in terms of the back office support. So we at SBS, we provide a lot of resources for the back office to help that MWB become successful. So proactively, I guess, what are, what are we doing to target, you know, businesses that are owned by women of color? How are we getting to them and telling them what's like that now what program is fantastic, but ha sounds fantastic. How are we, how, how do we wake up in the morning and target these businesses? So we've been working a lot with organizations that uh, have uh, either women of color uh, business uh, owners, uh, entrepreneurs, for example. Uh, I've attended a number of sessions uh, with sororities, for example. Um, so these are uh, black letter Greek organizations who have entrepreneurs who are thinking about doing uh, business um, or who have a business and may not have thought about growing their business through government contracting. Uh, certainly we've worked with um, uh, uh, um, uh, organizations in New York City um, like the Women Chamber of Commerce um, uh, and any organization that has a, a specific, uh, their constituency is uh, women entrepreneurs. Uh, we could do a lot more. Uh, we continue and, and through the assistance of the Office of MWB, we've been very aggressive in our outreach campaigns. Uh, so we've been running uh, not only digital advertising, uh, but also uh, working on uh, target advertising through social media. Uh, but we've done traditional media advertising. Uh, we've focused a lot on ethnic uh, publications. Uh, so there's a number of things that we've done, uh, but certainly would love to, uh, if there's any, if the council has any suggestions on where we should be putting our efforts, uh, happy to continue um, you know, the conversation and, and figure out ways we can uh, increase that pool. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to, something that we found while we were preparing uh, that I wanted to bring up and put on the record, um, we found that as of FY18, the city awarded 50% of all prime contracts to firm, firms owned by Asian men. Um, of all subcontracts, 
the city awarded roughly 43% of all awards to white women. So while we certainly applaud these successes in, in MWBE contracting, I think we would argue that there's now a disparity within a disparity. Um, um, Hispanic women were awarded just 2% of prime contracts. Black women were awarded just over a half percent of all subcontracts. So those are, you know, concerning for myriad reasons. Um, you want, is, I'll give you a chance if you want to respond. I'm not, you know, I'm just kind of putting that out there, something we found that was startling. So, so thank, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. I, 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 we too are uh, concerned with those numbers. Um, you know, while they are, you know, um, sort of overall, at, you know, minority community is doing better in our program um, because we're doing more contracting, um, the challenge still remains. And, and this is a challenge that we have. Um, how do we engage uh, women of color in our program uh, to move women of color to what we believe they can be? Um, we know this challenge is not just uh, limited to us in the private sector market. It's the same situation that we're seeing um, because, as you know, markets are, uh, you know, discriminatory to certain groups. And even in the venture capitalist market, for instance, less than 1% uh, of venture capitalists was actually um, given to, MW, to uh, women of color and who have been really successful over the last decade or so in actually building businesses and, and so forth. So there's structural issues that they face, uh, you know, when I say they, they the uh, women of color face um, in the, in the uh, marketplace. Those are challenges that we're, we're working to address on our end. For instance, our, our access to capital programs such as our contract finance fund, our bond fund, and our EDLF fund, emerging developer loan fund, all geared to addressing some of those real life challenges that those entrepreneurs face in the marketplace that we don't control. And so uh, when they do come to, to us, uh, there's, there's the remaining challenges that city procurement is have some more um, uh, challenges in the sense of what we require because it's tax dollars we're using, obviously. It's a bit more in the private sector. And so those firms, as they transition over to city procurement, uh, we have, uh, you know, trying to ensure that they get all the services that SBS provides and the targeting that the commissioner just spoke about. But are those numbers, are we happy with those numbers? Absolutely not. Um, you know, we know that uh, African Americans, uh, about 12 percent, Hispanics, uh, Americans um, are around the same or so in our program overall, but particularly with our women entrepreneurs, um, that is something that we are working on very intently and it's something that we're not looking at lightly. But it, again, it's a very complex um, phenomenon in the sense of what we have faced in the marketplace. Who are, are the firms that are actually uh, signing up with us and what they actually do and what we actually require and need as a city and breaking some of those barriers down in order for us to address it. So we do concur and we look forward to working with you some more on, on those, uh, those, that particular issue, which is, a, which is a stubborn one for us that we're working on uh, diligently. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly appreciate the complexity. I mean, it's hard for me as, I'm not a guy who likes to point at something and say that's a problem unless I have a solution, but I'm also not the MWBE guy, right? So. Um, we want to support right. you however we can. Right. Um, but, you know, seeing some of these numbers w was startling. I wish I had the answer of how to make it better, but I, that's, I, I, that's your job, right? So I, I think collectively um, what we can do is talk about um, the program itself in terms of now is the best time if you are a minority women-owned business to actually certify with the city of New York because there's true commitment from uh, the top down to actually engage. Uh, I was at a conference in Boston and met a black woman owned a heavy civil engineering company who's very successful in other cities. And my first question to her was, why are you not in New York City? And she had a number of reasons why she was not operating in New York City, uh, which I won't get into in this hearing, but certainly we are- Anything 
anything related to what we're talking about today? No, it's it's literally just doing business in, in terms of uh, you know a- access to the workforce, access to there was certain things and, and the mis and and her misunderstanding of the, the the marketplace itself. I think we need to do a job. Um, a better job in positioning the city of New York as a city of opportunity, uh, especially for firms that have looked to grow their businesses and want and put and New York City could be a potential uh, next uh, frontier for them. Uh, and certainly the firms that are here uh, building their capacity. Uh, so certainly there's a no, that uh, when Janelle talks about it's complex. There's you know we have to walk and chew gum at the same time, which we are doing. Uh, but certainly we want it, we share the same concern that, that you have in terms of uh, figuring out how to do more targeted recruitment of some of the firms that we need to see more of, right? So black engineering companies, for example, is one of them. So uh, can I just add one thing, council member? So, uh, you know, we have seen um, some successes in this area in our work, right? Um, EDC has a Construct NYC program essentially manages all of the construction and improvements to their facilities and other facilities, et cetera, across the city, which is, as you can imagine, is pretty extensive. Um, they went out for a uh, pre-qualified list of, cert- of uh, uh, construction uh, managers, CM firms, to actually manage all the projects. And out of the three, out of the five, sorry, three were um, actually African-American owned businesses and two were uh, WBEs, meaning, um, black-owned, women-owned businesses. And they are managing significant projects around the city um, to the tune of about 80 million or so of projects um, that they are managing. So, uh, you know, we, while we're not there yet, I mean, we do have some, some light at the end of the tunnel where we see that some of our work and sort of how we approach this, because uh, EDC could have went with one or two, uh, but they chose to make it five, right? And so by expanding that, and changing the way that they went about that procurement, we were able to uh, include more um, MWBEs in the process, and now we have three out of the five who are actually conducting that types of services. And again, two um, of a very, very, um, uh, very accomplished MWBE uh, black women-owned businesses. And so, uh, you know, there are challenges ahead, but we are seeing some some light in in, in sort of how we do the procurements. Meaning, if we break them up more. Uh, if we uh, advertise or work with our office and SBS to certain ways, the agencies, you know, we can be successful. And, and so that's some of the things that we are working on. Good. I have a couple more things, but I want to um, give some time to former chair of this committee, uh, Councilwoman uh, Helen Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Chair Brandon. I know I turned it off to someone who is going to give fresh perspective on this, and that's exactly what it needed. So I'm really glad that you're chair of this committee. I had a couple of questions, and maybe you've already answered them. Good to see you guys. Um, Great to see your staff again, too. I sort of miss the home team, Um, just sort of. Um, But I wanted to ask um, a couple of things. First of all, congratulations on the number of MWB firms that you've certified. That's, that's a big jump. Um, it's a jump of over 1,000, I think, since last year. So that's really great. And also that y- under local law one, you're up to 20%. That's extraordinary. Congratulations on that. I mean, I know it's just a point in time, but that's, that's really great. You, your efforts, which you've laid out here, are really paying off. Um, and it would be, actually, that reminds me, it would be interesting to sort of analyze each of those efforts and think about what impact they had, like um, which was the most successful component part. You know, is it access to capital? Is it access to loans? you know, and you sort of go through the list of things that you specifically worked on and talk about whether or not, you know, there's great demand for that access to capital. If you had more that you could be bonding or whatever, um, that that would be even more helpful. That'd be interesting to learn. I don't know if you have that as part of your report, but that would be cool. I guess I'll stop there. That's a question. Could you identify that? and? 
identify which programs you'd like to expand? So, so council member, thank you so much for that question. Um, I, the, 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 the short answer is yes. Um, the more long answer is uh, we, we find that our program has been successful for many reasons, um, but one of the major ones is the fact that we are compensating for some market challenges that firms face that are outside of our purview. When I say outside of our purview, we don't control the, the financial markets as a city, right? Um, and so what we're finding is one, the mayor's sort of aggressive goals we've put out there very vocally, very visibly. Um, and so the community is beginning to see that there is real change happening. Um, I would go as far as to say the creation of our office and, and, and making this a mayoral priority. Um, again, the community is seeing, and so the interest is rising and rising that here we have opportunity, come do business with us. Uh, the city is a place for you to do business. And then we also provide a suite of services uh, that you can get in order to do business with us, such as how to do business with the city uh, or contract with the city, um, you know, various uh, capacity building programs at SBS. So yeah. I, I do believe that, and, and, and we agree that expanding the initial 30 million investment was important. That's why we went to the bank, city banks, and worked with them to add an additional 40 million to those funds. And so, um, yeah, I think as we put them all together, it's probably uh, why we're seeing the increased utilization amounts other things, but uh, we do agree. It would be interesting to track, though, some, if there were a tracking mechanism for that. It would help the city together advocate. Um, so that would, I think, be helpful. Um, is there any one particular area that, um, where you've seen that growth, given that it's doubled um, the number of awards from 465 to over a billion, is there one, is it in construction that that happened? Because now we had those goals specifically for HPB. Yeah. So, so um, I, I think so. Construction is it, we do a lot of construction, and and so I, I think you would see. Uh, some changes, uh, more drastic changes in the construction um, side um, than we would elsewhere because, I mean, our capital program is almost a hundred billion in the next 10 years and certainly we, as council member mentioned earlier, uh, DDC uh, puts out a lot of work and all our construction and capital agencies do as well. So we will generally see sort of movement in that area that will reflect a bit more um, on what procurements are happening right now and the investment the city's making. So yes, I think there's a tie-in there. Um, also, if you look at DDC in particular, uh, they went and they strategically broke up the contracts into micro, small, medium, and large. Um, EC? DDC. DDC, uh, but that's uh, old news. That's from two years ago they started doing that, right? Correct. So we're seeing the results of that now. So we're talking about Still trends great. and why, why, yeah, why we're moving in that direction, a and positive direction. And are you direction. asking any other agencies to do that? Oh, yeah. So we have spoke to uh, other agencies about doing that. But particularly what we really want to do where we can see the real results, um, and I mentioned in my, in my testimony, is have an actual pre-qualified list where we can set aside projects yep. specific for MWBEs. And I think that is the type of um, approval from the state that we need because we recently got the approval for the raising discretionary and we see that agencies are using that at yep. a rapid rate and they're very excited about it. And so is the community. So I, I think once we see those changes, policy changes, the fact that we are very aggressive with these goals, we are vocal about them, and the services that we provide either with access to capital and or the other service that SBS provides. Great, that's exciting. Um, do you, of the, if we could just take a snapshot in time, of the 6,829 MWB certified firms, how many have contracts with the city? If you take a snapshot in time, so so on on average, about twenty uh, about twenty six percent of the certified pool wins contracts per fiscal year. 
Um, and of those firms that win contracts, about two thirds have you utilized one of our services that I mentioned earlier. Sure, sure. Um, now, what's happening with the other 75% of firms that don't have contracts with the city? Does this, is this 26%, you know, usually draw from the same MWBE firms? Or is it that there are cadre, I've always wondered, are there cadre of firms that are getting certified and sort of what, do they ever get a contract? So maybe that's another way to ask the question too. How many of the 600 800 have never gotten a city contract at all? Well, I, I wouldn't say never. I said any fiscal year, the, the percentage sure. that we see. Over the last five years. So, I mean, so for example, a construction company, MWB, that won a contract, so let's say two fiscal years ago, could still be working on that yeah. contract. Uh, so I, the, that breakdown we don't, I, I don't have in terms of the totality of, you know, over a snapshot of five fiscal years, how many MWBs are currently working on a contract. Yeah, We just look at, we, we look at how many MWBs have won per fiscal year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so certainly, I mean, that's an interesting way of, of looking at, at the pool. Uh, what we're looking at as well is uh, how many new firms are winning. And, and we've seen a 20% increase uh, of new firms winning. So that means that, and especially in, um, where agencies have discretion, what we saw with the, the, the increase in discretion, uh, firm agencies were able to try out new firms. Yep. Uh, so we to we're totally we're sensitive to the fact that you don't want a situation where there's just one company monopolizing on a particular area. Yep. Uh, you want to be able to, uh, you know, spread, sort of spread the wealth, as you, you would say. Uh, but you, we also want to make sure that, that the newer companies are prepared, uh, and that's the work that we do. I guess what I'm, that's awesome. Congratulations, that's really cool. I guess what I'm trying to get at is, um, I think you could say that given the expanded number of services that the city offers through the MWB program, more access, more capital and loans, and um, more classes and more specific classes, and you know, sort of making the classes more robust, everything that you've done. All of those things have happened and have led to good things happening. Mm -hmm. I still am wondering um, for is getting certified the right thing, getting certified, which is sort of an additional step to taking all the classes or doing whatever, is getting certified, are there firms who get certified because they think, oh, it's gotta be a good thing to be certified as an MWBE, but then nothing happens after that. And the reason it's important is because over the years, I keep hearing from firms that say, I went through all the work, I got certified, and then nothing happened. Right. And I do think that over time, you've done an amazing job um, shortening the amount of work, lessening the amount of difficulty to become certified. But I'm just sort of wondering, okay, now you've lessened it, that's still, that's great, because we want to make it easier. But again, our, what we don't want is the word on the street to be, why get certified? So I, I think the, the metric that I use is our recertification rate. Um, so a couple of years ago, our recertification rate was hovering about 59%. Okay. Last fiscal year, our recertification rate was 80%. So that tells me that people see value in, the certif in being certified. Um, and I, I think it's the opposite. I've heard a lot of people, and when I go out and I speak at events, a lot of people said, hey, I think I'm certified. It was really, there was nothing there for me, but I'm hearing other people win contracts, and I see the mayor talking about, you know, all the efforts that's happening, so I want to, I, I need to figure out how to get recertified. Yeah. Uh, so we have seen a tremendous spike in our recertification rate, so I think that is probably the, the metric that I would use to determine whether, you know, whether or not people feel that certification has value, and I would say that it's a resounding yes. Yeah. It'd be interesting to track that. I forget if that's in the procurement indicator report or not. It's, it's part of our mayor's management report uh, uh, as part of the agency in terms of uh, our recertification rate. Okay. Yep. And if there are a way you could identify the firms that never get contracts and maybe therefore drop out, don't get recertified, 
Yeah. But I think that'd and, be and, interesting. And that is something we are, because we obviously, you know, if a firm wants to get certified, there's nothing I can do to stop that firm from being certified. Oh, uh, sure. So even if the city doesn't buy any of their goods, sometimes people just want to have the label that they're a minority and women business uh, enterprise. Um, and so we try to be very uh, 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 deliberate in our outreach efforts. Uh, but for example, if, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to figure out some random firm because we buy so many things, I'm gonna say something that we actually buy. But, but if there is like a uh, beauty salon, for example, that just, for, just wants to get certified, you know, that, will, that number will be in our-, in our Sure, uh, yeah. And that Fair. firm may not ever win a contract because the city wouldn't need their services. Uh, but that is, the, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, and certainly we are very sensitive to the fact that uh, that is why our certification, our strategy, our outreach strategy is very targeted because we don't want to just certify yeah. any and all That's firms. Great. Yeah. So. I think it was, the industry was restaurants and catering services. So even a restaurant, if they have a catering arm, we will certify them because there, there's catering services that's necessary uh, that agencies procure. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, keep up the good work, Chair. I want to um, acknowledge uh, Councilwoman Inez Barron, who's joined us, and I want to allow uh, Councilman Perkins to ask a question. I just want to follow up on the recertification. So who, who uh, does not get recertified and why? So there's a number of reasons why firms don't recertify. Um, uh, so we have an aggressive strategy in terms of reaching out to firms uh, up uh, 180 days before their certification is up. Uh, typically what we find is it's firms either forget to send back the information. I mean, it's as simple as that, uh, which is why we're very aggressive in not only emailing, but calling, um, and sending uh, actual post letters uh, to make sure that they know that the certification, the recertif the certification is expiring. Uh, so there, there isn't any one reason why a firm may not recertify, and we even follow up after their certification is expired. Uh, we've been aggressive in terms of uh, calling up firms to remind them that the certification has lapsed. Um, so uh, some firms, like I said, um, you know, may not think there's any value, uh, but once we talk to them about all the efforts that's been made, uh, you know, they change their mind. So that's why you've seen that increase in the recertification rate. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Barron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel for being here. Uh, I believe that the FY18 utilization uh, numbers are 835 million in prime contracts that were given to MWBEs. And the data that I have says that black males received 9% of that amount or of the contracts that were awarded. Black females received only 3%. So my question is, uh, why is that figure so low for black women in particular? And what can we do? And what amount of money? Is it 3% of the contracts? Is that 3% of the dollar amount that they received? So, so the three percent are all of all uh, MWBE prime awards. Uh, right. I think, I think that's yeah. So, so that's 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 the percentage of where they sit in sort of all groups in the MWBE program, where they sit in the particular prime awards right. against the total. So, so, um, so, so, Councilman, th thank so you. So, is it three percent of that eight point eight hundred and thirty-five million that they received, black women? Correct. That's the three percent of the overall number that okay um so uh you know we we sort of been we we addressed uh in part some of this a bit early in our testimony but okay uh, it is certainly a challenge for us um and and i thank you for that question because it is a challenge for us and some of the issues we 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 identified was uh, one, um, we are doing strategic outreach, and the commissioner talked a little bit about that. Um, could probably reiterate a little bit of the outreach, strategic outreach we are doing, and sort of direct um, outreach to um, women-owned businesses who are uh, uh, black women-owned businesses. And then we talked about some of the structural and market issues that these types of businesses are faced with 
when they are trying to grow their business and scale their businesses, um, such as access to capital, if they go to the private sector market. Um, I, I mentioned that we know that venture capitalists, for instance, uh, only did less than 1% to MWBE uh, who are women, black-owned women firms. And that challenges, uh, of course, for them to actually grow and expand and to do business with the city because ultimately the city's requirements are more than the private sector. So we also talked a little bit about the, the work that we've done and such as providing capital for those types of businesses and the work that we continue to do. Um, are we there yet? No, but this is a challenge uh, that we have faced head on and will continue to and forward. do you find that there's a concentration of these black female-owned industries in a particular concentration of areas? Yes, yeah, so uh, that, that's a great uh, question because that, that is one of the concerns that we have. Um, and when we were talking about doing a targeted um, uh, recruitment for our certification, uh, most of the black firms, uh, black-owned firms, are heavily concentrated in what we call standard services. So this Standard? Is, yes. So this is like your trucking, your janitorial, your um, landscaping, et cetera, uh, where you, the dollar value of those contracts, while it's, 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 it's a large amount, it's not as high as, for example, in construction. Um, and then the other area where a lot of black firms are, are, are concentrated is actually in human services. Um, and I, the human services is not part of uh, that number where you're looking at LL, um, local law one. So, for example, you know, if if uh, for if uh, uh, one of our agencies uh, let out a contract to um, something in human services, and not capture that number. So, what we're trying to do is focus on areas where we're seeing high dollar value in, in contract awards, but low percentage in terms of representation. So, we're working, for example, with the Minority Supplier Diversity um, uh, uh, Council (MSDC), which focuses a lot on certifying. Uh, black-owned firms uh, to not only increase the amount of firms that are, are fast-tracked into our program, uh, but we're also looking at uh, our regional partners who are working with successful black firms uh, on their projects to understand why they're not actually operating in New York City. Uh, so we've taken a very targeted approach uh, to not only increase the, the pool of black-owned firms, that that's, that's uh, black uh, you know, male and, and, and women-owned firms, uh, but we're also looking at why they're not participating um, and, and what we can do in that, er in that area. And do you have the number of black female-owned businesses that have been certified? You have that number? Yes. So in, in uh, FY18, we have uh, 727 black women-owned firms certified. That's a, that's a, um, we've increased that number by 250 firms from the last fiscal year. Uh, so I think uh, Council Member Rosenthal was, was alluding to that and, and the chair was alluding to that. So we have made specific efforts. For example, I've uh, made presentations uh, at black uh, Greek sorority organizations uh, to talk about our program and to talk about the fact that if you're thinking about growing your business, government procurement might be one of the ways we do it. Uh, and we're also, as part of our, our outreach strategy uh, with the office of MWBE, we are actually um, taking, uh, we have a, a procurement fair at the, every year where we bring all the buyers together. We're actually taking that on the road. So we're going to different parts okay. of the city uh, because people may not have had the okay. time. Okay, when, when are you coming to East New York? Whenever you want us to come to okay. East New York. We, we, and that's one of the things. We'd love uh, to work with council, uh, and we have an outreach team uh, that will be in, in anywhere uh, to talk to businesses about how, um, how easy it is. And I have a mobile unit, uh, so we don't even need an office. And we've done it in other parts of, like, central Brooklyn, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'd be happy to follow up with your office. So we'll bring a team out. We'll have a sell into government class either in the unit or in your facility uh, so people understand how to actually uh, start the process. And lastly, you said there were 721. Uh, 727, 727 at the end of last fiscal year. Yep. That was certified. Yep. And how many of the 3% that were awarded as prime uh, prime awards, prime contractors, how many businesses does that represent? I understand 3% of the total went to black female uh, businesses. How many businesses does that represent? 
Good afternoon, Council Member. Uh, so we, I can get back to you on the number of firms that is, but it represents 254 prime contracts. 254 prime contracts. I'd like to get back to you on what the okay. number of firms that represents. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Perkins. Um, the outreach strategies, what, are, what do the outreach strategies look like? Uh, it's a number of things uh, from, uh, so there's paid media. Uh, so we've done aggressive campaigns on uh, the uh, transportation system. So subways, buses, um, we've done uh, social media. Uh, so that includes uh, Facebook, which we've actually, uh, we've had great success because we could do very specific targeting. Uh, but we've done all types of social media from uh, Instagram to uh, Twitter. Uh, we do uh, email. Uh, we work with, um, so the council also funds uh, leadership associations. Uh, it's it's a, a number of organizations within the community. Um, in, uh, Harlem Business Alliance is one of them uh, where uh, they are all also tasked with doing outreach to get more firms uh, certified in the local community. Uh, we have, we at SBS, uh, we do a number of events uh, across the city, as I mentioned, um, and we also have our mobile unit uh, where we've done working in, in partnership with uh, council member office, uh, with council members uh, to come into the community and actually do workshops uh, from our unit. Uh, so it is a very aggressive. It's grassroots, um, you know, and, and uh, certainly any ideas and any other ways you think we can uh, get out, get the word out that now is the best time to be certified. We'd be happy to work with your office. So. I'm particularly interested in the Harlem Business Alliance and such groups that are more or less in my district, but I'm also interested in who else is out there outside of my district that you might have some kind of alliances with that uh, would be useful to know about. Yeah, we, we work. Do you have a sort of a publicly available listing of such groups? I'd like to sure, we can, we can send you the, the long list, but it, it's everything, every group that you think of, uh, we are probably working with them. Uh, especially groups that are specific for uh, the different group uh, groupings. For example, uh, you know, in, when we look at Asian-owned um, uh, businesses, uh, we want to make sure that you know uh, uh, Chinese-owned businesses, Korean-owned businesses, they also know about the program. Uh, so we work with groups that are within those communities. Uh, so we have a very each other's communities as well. Correct, yeah. correct. So, uh, and of course, uh, the, all the chambers across the city, uh, any group that works with businesses, uh, we probably have a relationship with and we'll be happy to send you that list. Um, I wanna finish on asking some, some of the stuff from this disparity study. You guys are familiar with, yeah? Okay. Um, my favorite chapter is chapter five, the anecdotal analysis. Um, I think it's sort of, Good to hear from the people on the ground who are who are trying to access um, um, the MWBE world. Um, one of the things here that a couple of things that jumped out: um, an Asian American male owner of an engineering firm says construction management firms use MWBE certified firms on their proposal and during presentation to the agency. Then they get dropped afterward. Uh, after the award of the contract. So is, it, is there any way to prevent that from happening or, or to know if, if folks have done that in the past to? So, uh, sorry about that. Um, so uh, that's something we call bait and switch. Um, we, we have uh, certainly, I know that's in some parts of the industry from time to time we do hear about that. Um, we of course discourage that. Uh, we. Uh, we let the MWB community know and also our prime contracting community know if you're going to use an MWB to actually win a bid and use their numbers, I mean, it's unethical for you not to you go ahead and use that, that, uh, that MWBE. So, so that is a real uh, thing in our world. It's a real assessment of some of the challenges that we do face in monitoring for that. Um, but the challenge is, you know, we don't, as a city, we don't know what happens uh, when we put a goal out and the uh, contractors are amongst themselves negotiating back and forth, um, we're not privy to that, right? Um, and when the bid comes to us, we also are not privy to how the contractor actually came up with that number. 
Um, and sometimes we find out after the fact that a firm actually participated with that prime contractor to get a number, and then that prime contractor ultimately does not end up using that uh, contractor. And also, in, in fairness to some contractors who actually um, are doing the right thing, um, you know, the scope of, of work may change as well, um, you know, once the project gets started where um, a particular firm may not need, be needed anymore or that particular work may have changed so they have to do change the, the particular um, MWBE or subcontractor that they have engaged in. So we want to be fair to in that, in those cases too, that there are some of that, but, but certainly we have um, flagged this and have talked to some firms who have said, they have experienced that, and um, we've addressed it uh, to, uh, as best as we can, but certainly the market, um, things happen before the bid gets to us and we, that we do not know of, and we hear about it after the fact. You want to add something? And I would just add that uh, once we've uh, agreed upon a goal for a particular contract, they can't then you know, uh, renegotiate that goal. And so uh, after a, the award of a contract, you've identified an MWBV firm up front, you've agreed on the percentage goal for that contract, switching out a subcontract that doesn't make the goal go away. And so what's important for us is to hold the agency and the vendor uh, accountable for the goal that they had on the contract from the beginning so that if you're swapping out a vendor, you're swapping it out for another MWBE. Um, another thing that jumped out at me was, um, it says Hispanic American female owner of a trade contracting firm said, um, primes contact you to submit numbers then you don't hear from them. They use your number and you have to pay for the drawings, insurance, estimators, but then you don't get the work. Mm. Um, is there any way to prevent that from happening? Uh, I think it's, it's generally the same scenario uh, as the previous uh, statement. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of activity happening in the private sector before they come to us. Um, we assess what is before us and um, sometimes we don't get access to all that activity until a, a, a MWB and or subcontractor speak to us concerning that. Um, and so, I, you know, it's, it's something that we're working on to see how we can better educate the MWBEs uh, about their, their rights. Um, also when they submit um, information to the primes, their agreement that they have with the prime contractors, um, which again, we're not privy to, uh, it's very important that they actually speak to them about, you know, if you were gonna submit a, a uh, scopes of uh, work that you think you can do and you had to go out and do, of course, um, estimates and so forth and, and, and come up with your proposal to the prime that the prime doesn't, you know, they're sort of binding there. I mean, so we, we are educating them on, on sort of how to ensure that they are um, astute where that is concerned. Um, but for us, again, the bait and switch issue and the fact that swapping out MWBEs uh, continues to be uh, something that we are looking at. Yes, sir. And, and maybe just to put in a, another pitch around Passport, this is the purpose of the system. Well, one of the purposes of the system is to provide more accountability on both the city and the vendor side, more transparency into who those Sub who those subcontractors are, the status of payments to them. Um, the city needs better tools in order to track these things post-award, and that's uh, one of our goals. I mean, I, I understand we can't be cognizant or aware of everything that's happening before or during or whatever it may be, but I'd assume that these firms feel like, look, I was trying to do business with the city. Like, I don't think they're blaming, ultimately, then, the prime contractor. They're saying, yeah, I was trying to do business with the city, and I got screwed. I, I think the part, so, so this is, we have a program called NYC Teaming where we, we talk about, you know, how to team up with each, each other or, or prime sub relationship. I think um, what Janelle has alluded to is that it, it's doing business, it's a, it's a relationship, right? So if you're the prime contractor, you have a number of uh, subcontractors that, uh, similar to like when we put out our, our RFP, we have a number of prime contractors that respond. When you're a prime contractor, you have a number of subcontractors that will respond. Um, and you have to make a business decision as that, that, that MWBE that's now building that relationship with that prime contractor if you are going to bid for that work. Now, if you bid for that work, 
um, and this is what we're talking about, and you're the prime contract, and you tell that MWB that, yes, I'm going to use your bid, then there's an ethical um, dilemma there if you decide not to, unless something happens. And so we have at, at SBS, you know, we have a whole team where uh, MWBs have, if they have complained to us, we will go to that prime contractor and figure and try to um, at least resolve the issue. Uh, but I think it's education, uh, and it's really uh, when we ha when we do our mentorship programs, et cetera, we help MWBs determine, uh, uh, looking at their financial position, whether or not uh, they should actually bid on certain work. Um, and if a prime contractor ends up having a, a reputation of you know uh, doing that bait and switch, then you know that's one of the things that we would educate uh, MWB on. Uh, but I think you know at a certain point, it's the cost of doing business, um, and you have as an MWB, you have to make the determination whether or not you want to actually uh, bid on that subcontract. Um, but certainly, you know, if they are using our services, then they know how to actually because we want to see more MWs being in the prime contracting position, actually, not in the subcontracting position. Uh, so certainly, we want to make sure that we point them to the right agencies uh, that they can have a direct relationship with the City of New York. Uh, Councilman Barron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to follow up on that line of questioning, so you don't have checkpoints once you grant the award. You don't have checkpoints to make sure that um, they're on track with what they had said they had intended to do to reach their goals. And if they don't reach their goal, what are the consequences? Is there a clawback? Or are they put on the you know, list, the second hand list, or do not return list? What happens when they don't come anywhere near their goal? And what do you see as a, uh, a reasonable range? for reaching the goal, how far off the goal do you say is acceptable? Um, so, Council Member, thank you for that question. I, I think um, a few things. Uh, first, um, yes, we do track uh, the utilization um, of our contracts. Uh, agencies are responsible to do so. Uh, we have MW officers who are at deputy commissioner level at every single agency. Our ACO staff are also uh, uh, available to make sure that that's happening. And also, uh, the, the general finance staff and procurement staff at the agencies, all are, and the program staff, all are empowered to ensure that MWBE utilization is being met. Um, we, uh, for MWBEs uh, who are participating in contracts and those contracts do not reach the goals, um, you know, there, there are processes where, um, and some instances where that is um, actually viable in the sense that, again, which is a change of scope or something happened where the MWB may not be available anymore. That's something that happens uh, with, with MWBEs. For instance, if you're an MWB on multiple contracts and then one contract gets going and you get busy and another one's getting ready to start and you're not able to do so, that does um, bring some challenges. So, so yes. So if that happens, uh, does, does that subcontractor, subcontractor say, oh, listen, I can't do it? Do we have something on record that documents that the person that was intended to be involved in this contract said, listen, I can't do it? So or if, I'm sorry. No. If, 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 a, if a goal is to be modified right. post-award or during the, during the uh, execution of the contract, mm -hmm. They have to come back to the agency to get that approval, oh, okay. and that modification comes all the way up to Mox and, and our office. We work together to ensure that this is legitimate. Okay. And then, if there's a challenge, SBS is also at play in the sense they say we can't find folks to replace them, etc. They provide the services to connect them to it. So we're not speaking of okay. instances where there's a lot of activity as, as such, but we just wanted to give a scenario. The possibilities are there, uh, but certainly okay. we don't. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. What, one thing I just picked up on, what, what we were talking before about the bait and switch, right? So if, if a prime had subbed out to an MWBE and then drops off, wouldn't you be able to have folks contact the prime to say what, what happened there? Contact the sub, so the, the, a sub, the prime, they have contact prime. both of them and say what what happened you guys are on track and now you're no longer part of the project yeah yeah absolutely so again when the agencies uh you know they monitor the contracts um so the execution of the contracts 
Uh, and so, again, they have the responsibility to go to the particular contractors in their management of that particular project or contract to figure out what happened um, and why they're not reaching their goals. Now, ultimately, they, they are reported up to us, and so when they come to us on a quarterly basis, when we meet with directors and commissioners, uh, our deputy mayor and uh, the ACOs who meet on a monthly basis with, with Dan and his team, uh, these discussions happen at that point. And uh, on some of them, they happen more frequently in the sense that we, we are in more communication or frequent communication with the agencies just because of maybe the types of projects or the sensitive, sensitivity of those projects or the challenges that they're having in MWBEs on those projects. So yes, we would know that, um, or at least the agencies who are managing that project are required to know that. And I think it's just imp important to reiterate that the goal is still the goal. As, as yeah. Janelle pointed out before, in order to change the goal, whether or not the sub said, I can't do the work, or the prime said, I don't want to work with you, the goal is still the goal, and so they'd have to find another MWBE to replace the one that's dropped off. Otherwise, they have to come all the way up to us to uh, modify the goal. Right, so they can't say, well, I tried to work it out with those guys, it didn't work, so now I'm just going to pick a regular firm. No, right. can't do that. OK. Um, I want to wrap up, but one of the things I wanted to ask, because some of the stuff I'm seeing is anecdotal stuff, is um, firms, MWBEs who are struggling with scale, growing, you know, growing their business and competing with larger, um, you know, larger companies, and you know, they can't grow if they don't have the same level of resources. Um, with the SBS lending and financing. Um, can you say how many certified MWBEs have received loans from the programs that SBS offers? And, and do you think financing programs help with more solvency and helping these businesses to grow? Yeah, so it's, it's a, there's a combination of things. Um, and I think um, not only is it access to capital, uh, but it's also the back office, uh, strengthening the back office. Um, so. Where we see a lot of, and I think uh, Councilmember Rosenthal was was pushing on this, um, uh, a lot of traction is actually on our mentorship programs, uh, because our mentorship programs goes into the day-to-day -day operations of that business. We teach those businesses how to be uh, smarter in terms of their ability uh, to uh, price out jobs, et cetera. Um, so in total, um, we have, um, uh, for our contract financing, uh, we have awarded about 46 loans, about 8.4 million, um, $8 million. I'll have to get back to you in terms of the number of firms uh, that represents. Um, but what we have, um, it, what I usually say is that these programs that we have is a response to what we heard from the community. Uh, so it's not necessarily sort of um, how fully utilized the program is, is the fact that we have the program. Uh, so, for example, there are firms that have multiple contracts um, that have the financial capacity to actually uh, bid on not only work on one contract, but bid on another contract. But if they wanted to grow their business and wanted to actually, uh, you know, bid on another contract, they now have a, 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 a program through contract financing where they can draw down some money to actually do that. Uh, so that is the reason why we build these programs, is to make sure we address some of the, the, the barriers that we've heard. Uh, but I would say that um, you know access to capital is one. Uh, I think access to a workforce um, is another. Um, and certainly one of the things that we've been working with our partners, um, you know, uh, whether it's through uh, a PLA agreement, et cetera, uh, you know, a lot of MWBs are, are trying to figure out which way they should go. And, and certainly access to a workforce that could work on city jobs um, is one of the, the barriers that we've seen. Uh, insurance is another one of those barriers. And these all go into uh, sort of on the state level, right? So we have a situation where um, with the scaffolding law, uh, if anything happens on a job, uh, whether you know if someone goes out and decides to have a liquid lunch and comes back, even though this company has trained that person 
you know, in nauseam, if that person is hurt on the job, there's a, there's a certain liability that that company faces. Um, that has increased the cost of insurance for everyone, including MWBs. Uh, so the, we are looking systematically at different barriers um, that is uh, preventing MWBs from being uh, successful and tackling them piece by piece. And of course, with your support and um, you know, and our, our partners on the state level, uh, we want to make sure we tackle some of those areas. My colleagues have anything else? Otherwise, I'm gonna okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, um, it's it's sort of tough love coming from our side, right? Like we want this to succeed, so we need to know how we can help you. Um, obviously, um, fighting in Albany to create some of these, um, you know, pre-qualified lists would certainly be a game changer. Um, so, you know, feel free to to engage us however we can help with that and um, you know hopefully you know some of your staff will stick around to hear testimony from from other folks because I think that's where um, you know you really get into what people are feeling on the ground you know and making sure that um, um, it's not all peaches and cream if you know if that's not what folks are hearing or feeling you know um, but thank you guys very much thank Take you care. Okay, so our first uh, panel, it's going to be uh, Lou Coletti, Bill Wilkins, and Brian Cunningham. Okay, you can start, whoever wants to start, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Hello? Okay, good afternoon. Um, as stated, my name is Bill Wilkins. I'm the Director of Economic Development for the Local Development Corporation of East New York. We are experiencing our 40th anniversary of working in economic development. Our tagline is growing businesses, strengthening communities, and changing lives in three program areas, industrial development, commercial revitalization, and entrepreneurship. Um, by way of giving you a, a historical perspective, in the mid-90s I was working as a loan administrator for the Minority Woman Lo Loan Trust Fund. This is from Urban Development Corporation before there was Empire State Development. And I asked to myself, like, why is there a need for a capital targeted to minority and women. And I realized that at my birth, my parents being of color could not vote. So the work in this space is vitally important. I think the problem from a historical perspective is that we've had 20 years of Republican mayoral control. And with that, the impetus has been on growing certifications. The number of businesses certified which is important, but the line I'd like to draw in the sand is on the back end, is the procurement. That's what's important. Um, one of the points that was raised in all of the questions from the council, very insightful, very granular, and I think it deserves a deeper dive to really look at the numbers, but my council member, because I'm in a resident of the 42nd, asked how many women Black women certified businesses are there, and the response was 727. Out of the 727, the follow-up question was how many were able to secure contracts? And the answer was 254. So I'm challenging those numbers. If it is true, that means one out of every three certified black women businesses are able to secure a contract. If that is the case, 
then that would be an excellent marketing tool. But I don't know if it's one in three. So that's one of the, the takeaways. Also, on, on page seven, if we're able to flip the chart, um, because the majority of the entities from DOT all the way down to homeless services, that's a majority of the money. Up top, great percentages, but they're not a major factor in the overall budget. Um, so I, I would say the line in the sand, the x-axis is the overall 50, um, 5.3 billion. We're at 16%, which is 853 million. We are moving in the right direction, SBS and the Office of Minority Women Business Contracting is pushing it and we are going in the right direction. But at the end of the day, I think if money were designated to community-based organizations strategically and targeted, not only for the certification, because now as a ED, as an economic development corporation, I have to certify 12 MWBs a year, but one of our metrics or deliverables should then also be in those businesses that we certify procuring work. And how can that be done? If there is some sort of incentive or an inducement with CBOs, then I think we can start to get the numbers that um, all of us would be very proud of. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's a great point, Bill. I mean, one of the things um, they had mentioned, I think it was, SPS, that some businesses just want to be qualified, but then they have no interest even or no real compatibility in bidding for these contracts. So it's great if we have those numbers, but if they're not getting awarded contracts, then we shouldn't be having a parade for those numbers. Exactly, and then we reach the 9,000, and you know, I think what's important, and it was brought out that 80% are recertified, because those are, you're sort of removing the fluff from the deck because those businesses are interested. Some just want the asterisk. And to the commissioner's um, point that we do have a lot of businesses uh, of color, and I'm speaking black and women, that are in the maintenance business or in the security business. And, and we also have to think of other areas of opportunity for us to bid in, and in some instances it is capital, and it is difficult for a business, especially back office, to go through the certification process, right. even though it has been streamlined, but you're the owner and you're also having to put in bids and monitor jobs and monitor, so that time away from the business is very valuable, and then if you're not successful in securing a contract, it becomes very difficult. I mean, even working with MWBEs to procure contracts on the federal level, after you make the widget, then you have to go to a subcontract to even to package it, to send it to the federal government or you won't be paid. And one other takeaway is that if you are certified through SBS and you're going to Albany, then you should be grandfathered into state certification. And if you ha are state certified, you should be grandfathered into city certification and also into SCA or into MTA. You, sh you can't really, it's too burdensome for this population to go through multiple certifications. If you're able to achieve one, it should be one and done. Fair, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Cunningham. I'm general counsel to the Building Contractors Association. Building Contractors Association being uh, one of New York's uh, largest union-based uh, construction contractor membership associations. The BCA uh, specific, their specific purpose is to negotiate collective bargain agreements with the various trades that our members do business with. Uh, to pick up on a couple of points mentioned by my fellow speaker here, we would love to see the streamlined certification process. The fact that there are, are tiers and levels of different certifications with different entities is uh, frankly ridiculous. If you meet the threshold of uh, qualifying as, a, as an MWBE for the state of New York, you should certainly qualify in the city or for the SCA, for the Port Authority. Uh, there's no reason that, it, that uh, you would have to go through multiple certification processes. And that's something that I think that everyone can certainly agree on. And, and rough those, uh, smooth out those uh, waters to make it easier for everybody. But uh, 
basically, our, our comments and the reason we're here today because uh, well, we did see the notice on the on the uh, on the calendar as an oversight uh, review. Uh, hearing. We weren't sure what we were going to be hearing from the mayor's office, if there were specific uh, recommendations that, go, that were going to be made based on the disparity study uh, that was recently uh, published. We have submitted a written uh, report for you, all of the members of the, of the council to uh, the committee to, to review. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to read it to belabor you. I want to make this as quick as possible for everyone to get a chance to speak. Uh, but we do think that we do have some problems with the way that the, uh, the disparity study categorized uh, what they call significant uh, underutilization. Uh, one of our problems is the fact that simply the fact that the disparity study, the, the review period 2006 through 2015, I believe it was, is, uh, uh, I don't think it reflects current market uh, uh, situations. And we point to in the statement we refer to the SBS compliance reports the quarterly compliance reports, and we copied uh, the reports, uh, uh, the, the breakdowns uh, for your review. And what we see in those reports is that the city is making substantial progress uh, uh, in the MWBE utilization rate, specifically to the construction uh, category, and that's where we are. Uh, so we'd like you to take a, ch take a look at those numbers, because I think the numbers uh, do present good news. Right? And one of the questions is, you know, when you have good news, what do we do with the good news? Uh, so that's something that we'd like uh, the, the committee to think about. But some of the, the comments that we heard, uh, some of the issues that were brought up by the, uh, the members of the, the mayor's panel, you know, I'd like to address some of those concerns or, or questions and see if maybe we, as a representative of, of the industry, uh, you know, whether or not I can, I can uh, answer some of those questions. And one of the, what's going on currently right now, with, uh, the New York State uh, Senate is conducting statewide MWBE, uh, essentially what we're doing right now, talking about the issue of MWBEs and what's happening throughout the state of New York. And this is happening all throughout the state. And New York City is a little different than Watertown, New York, obviously, but uh, what we're hearing from a lot of the uh, regional contractors is they're having to dip in to the New York City area contractor lists to get their MWBE contractors to come up to meet their goals. So a contractor up in Albany who's got a 30% goal, right, is, is looking to the New York City uh, contractors and pulling some of those New York City contractors upstate, right, because one Unfortunately, you know, uh, you know, what happens in a market, right? There's a need, right? You can make money, right? So contractors are representing a need, and they say, say, well, I can make more money if I go to this project upstate than I can if I try to bid down here. So that's, that's a real, that's what's, what's, that's what's happening currently out in the marketplace, and that has an impact on, on utilization rates down here because the pool gets smaller as, as more MWB contractor, contractors have to go elsewhere in the state to help other uh, outfits uh, uh, meet their goals you know, on their uh, public contracts. That's one thing that's happening out there, and that's uh, those those uh, those MWBE Senate uh, transcripts are available, and they're interesting to read. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's there's a hearing scheduled for uh, October 16th, I believe, here in the city. So, uh, and one thing that was brought up, and I think it's an interesting uh, something that the the city council and the mayor's office should look at. And I saw this on a, on, a, on a research paper, and I believe the author of the paper, I don't have it with me, but I believe the author of this report actually is in the, the mayor's uh, MWBE office. And he talked about uh, redefining categories of, of minority uh, based on actual you know, levels of historic discrimination to actually reflect. I think there was some discussion earlier about 40% uh, you know, uh, contracts going to, to an Asian contractor versus a 3% utilization rate for uh, a, a black woman, uh, you know, is there, is there a need to, to, you know, to make some changes within the groupings to, uh, you know, to give the, the groups that have more significant levels of historic discrimination a better opportunity to get their chance to step up to the plate. So that's one thing that uh, I think it should be considered. I was a little concerned when I heard uh, the mayor's office refer to, quote unquote, drastic changes 
in the construction industry. I have no idea what that means. I'd like for the, you know, hopefully uh, you know, that was just uh, a term of art that was being used in the discussion, and, and I'm not sure if the mayor's office has specific proposals that they're going to submit to the, to the uh, city council to uh, change local law one, uh, the participation goals, so I'm a little, I was a little concerned to hear that. Uh, and I'm a little, you know, I was a little concerned to hear about, and I'm not sure how this works, uh, specific set-aside projects, taking specific projects in their entirety and just placing them purely in an MWBE category so that they're only, you know, the only competitive bidding going on there is within the MWB categories. I don't know, if I'm, I don't know how that works legally. That would have something to have to be, to be looked at. Uh, one of the comments, uh, one of the concerns was that once MWBE contract has become certified, quote unquote, nothing happens. Uh, well, it is construction, and I'm speaking to the construction indus industry specifically. Uh, uh, construction is a very competitive business. Once you get that certification, you know, it's not going to drop in your lap. You have to get up and you have to make the bid and you have to be the, you have to be the competitive bidder. Right? If you're bidding to prime contractors, you're going to have to make sure that your contract is better than your competitor. Uh, so there's no guarantee just because you're MWBE that you're going to win contracts. Right? You have to be able to compete in the marketplace. Uh, so that's, uh, and as far as the, uh, the getting dropped after the awards process question, uh, if there are bad apples and there's bad apples in, en in any industry, uh, those bad apples, uh, there's, there's sufficient enforcement uh, mechanisms within Local Law 1 to, uh, to weed out those contractors. If, so, if a contractor tries to, to pull a stunt, uh, they're certainly not going to win any more city contracts once that reputation gets to the agency that they're talking about. Um, and as far as the city uh, creating uh, programs to increase financial security, we're, that is, that is an, a, a perfect issue for the city to focus on because increased financial security increases capacity, which increases our ability as, quote, unquote, the non-MWBE contractor world to have capable, qualified, and able contractor base to go to, right, if they can supply the bonding, if they can pay their payroll, if they can, for us, for union contractors, if they can make their pension contributions that need to be made. These are all reality questions that have to be uh, dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis. So any program that, that the city uh, creates to increase financial security for their MWBE contractors helps us and helps everyone. So on behalf of the BCA, we appreciate the opportunity to, to, uh, to uh, speak for a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, and I definitely will take a look at this. Thank Thanks. you. Lou. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. No. Red on or is red off? I hit it off. Sorry about that. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here to testify on a program that's very important to all of the BTA contractors. Before I begin to talk about the program, I, I, I hope that you would bear with me a minute because I think it's important to describe a little bit about who we are and who my members are. Um, the Building Trades Employers Association represents 26 individual trade contractor associations, BCA being one, the GCA is here as another one. Uh, we all have collective bargaining agreements and employ the building trade unions. There's 1,300 uh, construction managers, general contractors, and specialty trade subcontractors who in 2017 working with the building trades, put in place some $50 billion worth of public and private construction work last year. Um, attached to the back of my uh, testimony is, is, is this little document because I think it's important to tell you who we are. Okay, we have the largest number of MWB contractors of any contractor organization in New York. Okay? We have 83 certified minority and women-owned business construction companies. Uh, almost half of them, you can see by the chart, have, are doing $5 million of business or more. Um, the rest you can see. Uh, it is the BTA contractors who are employing the, 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 the diverse workforce that the building trades has. 65% of the 8,500 active union apprentices today are African American, Latino, and women. Over 2,000 New York City high school graduates have been placed 
and BTA contract their job sites through our construction skills program. And there you can see the breakdown by race and by borough. BTA contractors are employing over 900 returning military veterans from active duty through our Helmets to Hard Hats program that labor and management work on together. We are also employing over 1,500 women through the non-traditional employment for women program. Let me say this about apprentice programs, because I think they often get mischaracterized. They are not temporary jobs. They are full-time, permanent jobs. Um, they get a salary, health benefits, pension while they're being trained. Uh, the cost of that training is about $35,000 a year uh, for, for anywhere from three to five years, depending upon the trade. That training is paid for by all the contractors. There isn't a penny of public subsidy in that program. In 2017, to try to get our arms around this program, the, the BTA and its members uh, and put out two reports, one which I think I, we've given you both. One is a real groundbreaking report. It's the first of its kind in the nation. And it talked about the, the capacity of MWB contractors here in New York City. What Dr. Thomas Boston did was went to the city controller's office and took the number of actual contract awards by race, by size of contract, by trade, and compared them uh, to the capacity of the industry. There's a much shorter version. I have the executive summary in there for you to look at, and came to the remarkable conclusion that it, it was virtually impossible to attain the 30% MWB goal the city set. We have our own MWBE Leadership Council who then put together a report with a series of recommendations that we've included for your review. Now, several of them require state uh, authorization. So what I'd like to do now is, is to talk and really zone in on what we believe you can do in the City Council. Uh, we would ask you to amend Local Law 1 and first of all, Eliminate the liquidated damage clauses in city contracts for failure to when goals are not met. Financial penalties are illegal. If you look under the U.S. Supreme Court case, Croson versus Richmond, the MWB program is, is to attain aspirational goals. And our worst fear is that someday soon, if there's continued liquidated damages and financial charges against our contractors, somebody is going to challenge that. And if that gets challenged, then the entire program could be at risk. We don't want that to happen. So we would ask you to put in the, the legislative language a, a requirement that eliminates liquidated damages. Second of all, the city has an MWB advisory council. Many of us used to be on it. We're not anymore. We don't know why. If, if our members are giving out $50 billion worth of work, wouldn't it make sense to bring us together with the MWB Advisory Council to talk about ways to do it? So we would ask you to amend local law requiring members of my organization to be on that committee. Third, we would ask you to consider legislation that defines exactly what a 30% goal is. And that 30% goal should be based on the hard costs of construction, not soft costs, not architectural and engineering fees. That makes it more difficult for the city to hit its goal and it and makes it really unrealistic. We're interested in 30% of the construction costs. Capacity building. We, the BTA has been working with the small business services to develop a curriculum and that would help provide capacity building training to MWB members. Our members would gladly volunteer to teach those courses if we were given a 10% credit toward the goal for spending our time and money and helping contractors grow. You know, we cannot, by law, provide training or help to MWB subcontractors who are working for us on a particular job. We tried that in the past, and all we did was get the federal government in and find us hundreds of millions of dollars for violating the commercially useful function standard, 
So right now, the position we've taken with MWB contractors that work directly for us, can't do the job, terminate the contract. There should be a closer relationship with us with SBS. We work with them, but I wish it was closer. Another recommendation we, we would have, and I'd love to see this in legislation, period, is that the city needs to reform its contractual policies in a way that it's going to help MWBEs grow their businesses instead of impeding their growth. Eliminate the no damages for delay contract language. Improve your change order and payment provisions. If we don't get paid, they don't get paid. Last, I, I, I would suggest to you, if you're looking for a model program, look to the New York City School Construction Authority. They have a program that we work close in partnership with, but the way they address the commercially useful function process is they pay consultants. If, if one of our contractors sees an MWBE firm having trouble on a job they're performing with them, they go back to the project manager for the SCA and they say, listen, this firm needs some financial help, it needs some insurance help, it needs some bonding help, and then an independent consultant is hired by the school construction authority, not by the contractor performing the work, that then go as, and can help that MWBE contractor grow. The way it's structured now, we, we just cannot do it. Um, to give you a size of, of the opportunities that we have over the next couple of years, last year the New York Building Congress reported that there was $61 billion worth of public and private construction put in place in this city. They're projecting that over the next two to three years, $50 billion in construction capacity in the public and private sector is going to happen. If we, if, if we don't do reform now, then when? When the economy collapses? Doesn't make any sense. So I'll close by giving you a Confucius saying that I came across many years ago that I, I continue to, to use. When goals can't be reached, don't adjust the goals, adjust the action steps. And that's what we need in the city's MWBE program to really achieve what everybody wants to achieve. Don't make it harder for prime contractors to, to provide contracts to MWB firms. Don't make it harder for contractors to do work in the city of New York. So I thank you for the opportunity to, to speak here, and I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Lou. You are the Confucius of the industry. <laughs> um, Some people would say I'm the confused of the industry. <laughs> now, this is great stuff. Um, and this is, the, you know, this is, yeah, I think, you know, what we're trying to get into before is some steps to fix the problem, you know. Um, like I said, I mean, I'm not a type of, I don't think any of my colleagues are a type of people who point at something and say that's a problem and go, well, I don't, you know, you deal with it. Like, we want to be partners in fixing this. So having the ideas of where we could tighten stuff up legislatively and where the city can, can act now is very important, you know, to sort of throw up our hands and say, well, Got to wait, you know, to go up to Albany and fight. I get it. It's 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 got to happen, but I don't know if we're, you know, if we're sort of exhausting all our options on, on the city level. No, I I really believe not to interrupt you that yeah. these are mechanisms that were if it were in local legislation, you can control. You can make the program better. You don't have to worry about the state. Whenever we go up the state, I don't have to tell anybody here. There's a whole lot of other dynamics that go into. And so uh, we, we've advocated with the city for changes they wanted and, you know, they fell on deaf ears. So why not find a way to control what we can control here? And I think some of the suggestions we gave were things that you can control by amending the law and making the program better for everybody. Uh, Councilwoman Barron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the committee. Um, Mr. Coletti, I just have a couple of questions. So. I guess I wasn't really paying close attention, but did I hear you say that 30% goal is not realistic or should not be because no. at the end, it seemed to contradict what I thought I'd heard you say in the beginning. No, in, in terms of 30% of, say, a city's capital budget, construction budget, it's not attainable. They, right now, we do not have the MWBE contractor capacity 
to achieve consistent 30% goals. You might get it a project here, a project here. It depends on what kind of project it is. You know, there's a big difference in how you do a civil uh, project. I know Denise will get into that. Then if you do a building project, very big difference. So the, the So I did hear you say that. Yes, sir, you did. But then it seems to contradict your closing, which is don't change the goal, change your action steps. No, I don't think it's contradictory at all because I okay. don't think the problem is the 30% goal if it's conducted within the legal framework of being an aspirational goal. If you're going to tell us it's a mandated goal, my, my comments are very different. But the law requires that it be, the goal be aspirational, whatever the number is. So I don't want to, I don't want to focus on the number. I want to focus on how you build the capacity to, to achieve whatever the number is. Okay. Uh, moving on to your testimony, you said that of the 8,500 active apprentices, so there are 8,500 active apprentices, 65% are African American, 33 Latino, 27 Asian, and other nationalities, 5%. How many inactive apprentices are there? Because what I have heard from those who are in apprenticeship programs is that Yes, they have a job and they get paid and they get benefits, they're permanent jobs for as long as the job lasts. But then once the job ends, they're no longer employed and they've got to wait for well, another opportunity. But if they want to stay a part of the union, they've got to pay union dues. And so that's what I've heard as a complaint for those who are in apprenticeship and programs and I that they don't get the opportunity to get enough time to get into the union. So could I, you I speak to that? I think that's correct, okay? Okay, but no, no one in, in our industry, no one's guaranteed a job. You come through the apprentice program, and that's why I'm saying the opportunity over the next five years, if you go into the union halls today, there are no workers, none, zero. And our members are gonna take the most productive members. We're not required just to take anybody out of the hall. We need productive workers because we have low bid, especially in public work, low bid uh, numbers that we have to make. If somebody is not being productive, we have the absolute right to fire them, like in any other industry. So if they're on the bench now, they perhaps need to go for some retraining. Um, but. But that's the nature, that's the way this industry is structured. During good times, everybody's working, whether you're an apprentice or a journeyman. When times are bad, our members have to lay people off. They go back to the hall. They, they start to go out to contractors on their own. Um, they do what they need to do. That's just the way the industry is structured. We're very, very um, sensitive to economic times. That, that has happened. We're just happen to be in some good ones right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you guys very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next panel, uh, Denise Richardson and Melissa Chapman. You guys are here, come on up. Thank you guys for coming, and you, you can start whenever you're ready. Hi, good afternoon, Chair Brennan and uh, members of the committee and guests. Melissa Chapman with the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. I'm commenting on behalf of our acting president, Rick Russo. Uh, the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce um, has over 2,000 members, and we promote economic development across Brooklyn. Since 2003, the Brooklyn Chamber has operated SVS's NYC Business Solutions Center in Brooklyn. This location serves as a walk-in center for small businesses and startups to help them succeed and become viable by accessing information and direct services, including MWBE certification. In addition to MWBE certification, we also offer programmatic and financial support services to MWBEs, including fin finance assistance, accessing capital, business planning, navigating government and a host of other uh, programs and services. We 
also have an active MWBE committee at the Brooklyn Chamber that meets regularly to address the unique challenges of MWBE Chamber members and advocates on their behalf with the goal of eliminating disparities in the procurement process. Based on their feedback and our extensive experience assisting and certifying MWBE businesses, we have four recommendations that will help these businesses thrive. First, as some of uh, the, my colleagues alluded to earlier, uh, one of the largest concerns uh, raised by MWBEs is how challenging it can be sometimes to be certified for all city, state, and federal government entities and authorities. Therefore, we join them in recommending a unified MWBE certification application for all city and state government entities and authorities, including New York City, New York State, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, and the Metropolitan Transit Authority. This application should tie into federal certification process, including that done by Federal Small Business Administration. We understand that certain addenda might be required in addition to the basic cert certification application. However, the application of itself should be concise and ask for legal requirements in a language that is accessible to all MWBE firms, including small and micro businesses. Number two, in addition to regarding, uh, in, I'm sorry, information regarding the time frame for MWBE certification should be communicated to applicants um, in a clear manner and should be publicly available. This would enable businesses to anticipate the time frame to receive certification and for government and other certifying entities to measure the efficiency of their respective processes. Third. MWBE procurement opportunities should be presented in a digital user-friendly format that is updated regularly and easy to navigate. This will help businesses seeking MWBE firms to have better access to available services and in so doing, expand contracting prospects. Finally, the state should increase New York City's discretionary spending for MWBE firms to 200,000 from 150,000 to mirror the 200,000 ceiling, ceiling already in place for New York State. In June 2017, Governor Cuomo and New York State legislate, Legislature enacted legislation increasing New York City's discretionary spending from a, to 150,000 from 20,000. We recommend it being increased further to 200,000. I thank you for the opportunity to comment in this matter, and we look forward to working with the administration, the council, and all of our partners to ensure increased access for procurement opportunities for MWBEs. Thank you, Melissa. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm Denise Richardson, Executive Director of the General Contractors Association. In the interest of time, I will summarize my comments and touch on something that has not been talked about today, and that is the SBS directory of certified MWBE firms. There's a big disconnect in the whole process between a firm becoming certified and the manner in which the firm identifies the type of work that it's, it performs. And so what happens is in SBS, the focus is on certification of the firm. Is it a minority and women-owned business, what is its finances, where is it located, et cetera. Then in a completely separate process that's not really overseen by anyone, there is an, uh, a, an information system called the payee information portal in which the MWBE firm selects from over 70,000 National Institute of Government purchasing codes to indicate the type of work that it performs. However, there's no real oversight within SBS or within the Mayor's Office of Contracts or anywhere where an MWBE can go to get guidance on which codes to select, which codes are most appropriate, and most importantly, there's no real systematic review of the system to, I, to make sure that firms have, in fact, selected codes. So we did our own analysis of the SBS directory, and it's, it's uh, some excerpts of our analysis are attached to my testimony. And one of the things that we discovered was that 14, over 1,400 firms, which is approximately 25% of all of the certified MWBEs, have no codes associated with their businesses. 
this is a significant problem because when prime contractors or when agencies are looking to direct solicitations to MWBE firms, they select by codes. So if someone is looking for landscaping services or someone is looking for someone to supply office furniture or whatever, they are going in to the system and selecting the pertinent NIGP code that matches. If a firm has no code associated with them, they get no solicitations. So this is a big disconnect that needs to be solved, but it's enormously painstaking work. Similarly, there are a number of firms that have checked off hundreds of codes for work that they do not do. That also needs to be systematically reviewed. What we're recommending is that SBS be given the resources to bring in some consultants that have experience with the NIGP coding system to work one-on-one -on -one with the MWBE community to sort out their codes. We did it on a limited basis two years ago uh, for firms in the heavy civil codes in particular so that we could get a handle on what was going on and we gave the information over to SBS and they were on a, on a limited basis, again ours was a very limited survey, were able to help those firms you know, resolve their coding issues and what we would like to see is have that done on a much broader scale. One of the complaints that that you probably get as council people and as we get all the time is that MWBE firms get solicitations from prime contractors for work that they, they don't do and that's driven by the problems with the coding list. The other thing that needs to happen is that in New York City there is a requirement that if you do plumbing or electrical work you must be licensed. Overwhelmingly the list of firms that are listed as providing elect electrician work or providing plumbing work do not have licenses and that's because again they are in the wrong codes. So our recommendation today, there's a lot of issues that we agree with that others have talked, talked about, but the thing that I wanted to bring to your attention today is the need to sort out this SBS directory to make sure that the right firms have the right codes so that firms can start to get the right solicitations and more importantly SBS can then use their mentoring program resources and their financial resources to more efficiently target the firms that need help because right now with the list being in what I will call disarray and I don't mean that uh, in a negative way toward SBS, it's, it's a function of the system, they're not in a good position to be, really be able to pull out firms that are bidding, firms that are not bidding, firms that you know may, may, should be candidates to participate in the programs because the directory is so scattered. And that's my recommendation. Thank you. That's, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, you, who is telling these firms to apply to every code under the sun? Are they being led to believe that that would somehow make them more likely to get picked for a bid? I think that that's, a, that's kind of an outdated um, reflection. I think in the early years of the program, absolutely there was a mindset of get certified, sign up for everything so that you can know what's going on. Now, with so much more outreach and a, a higher goal is leading to higher solicitations. So now it really, for the firms that are doing business, it really is time to be more focused on making sure that you get the right solicitations for the right work you do. So for example, someone who is a roofing contractor should probably not also not be in a plumbing code because roofing is a specialized you know, contracting field. It's unlikely that that same firm also does plumbing. So those are the kinds of things that should be looked at. Okay, thank, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. I'll take a look at all this. Okay, I guess we're gonna let everyone out on good behavior. Um, thank you all for joining us and this meeting of the Contracts Committee is adjourned.